So one thing before we get going into this, um, don't check Blackboard for your grades. I don't update Blackboard. Like if I have to fix a grade for somebody, which I do a lot, I mean, like when things don't load, or if somebody says, I think I got this question right, I'm like, oh, you know what, you did. I don't fix it in Blackboard. I got about five or six emails over the weekend, and I, some more came in over the weekend. I'm sure this is what they're about to. Like, I, I told you about this, and you didn't fix it. I did fix it. If in the progress report it's fixed, that's fixed. The progress report is an Excel spreadsheet I hold on the computer outside of, outside of Blackboard. The reason I do that, it seems, like, it seems like I'm reinventing the wheel by doing that. And the reason for that is I have a lot of little individual things in the Excel spreadsheet that I can't do in Blackboard. For example, we're going to talk about something called the rainy day coupons today for the exam. I can't put those into Blackboard. It won't let me do the same formatting I need to do in Blackboard. So I have to do it in an Excel spreadsheet by itself. So all I do is when you guys submit me an assessment, I grade it like I did on your exam on Thursday. And then I copy a column of grades out of Blackboard into Excel. And then it just becomes part of my Excel gradebook. And that's where all your grades come from is that Excel uh, spreadsheet. So don't check Blackboard for meaningfulness, because it won't be meaningful at all. It, 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 I mean, it's, I shouldn't say, it's not, it's not that it's not meaningful at all. It's just that if I've ever changed a grade for you, it won't show in that, in that Blackboard gradebook. Cool. You can totally go into gradebook, uh, to go to Blackboard and look at the comments and stuff on the exam that I make, which hopefully I made a whole bunch for you guys. Um, and they'll all be visible, you know. Uh, but as far as any change to your grade, it's not going to happen. Except in, uh, except in Excel. Yeah, pretty. Well, the only comments that you do, they're not going to be on the actual, you don't go on the computer and actually do it on what we submitted as the assignment, right? You put the I did. You do? I, I, I open your assignment up. I'll look at your assignment. Okay. And then if I see a comment I want to make, I'll click on, there's a little tab I can select. Okay, that's I click top. on it and a little, and then the whole thing opens up over here and I type something. Okay. And usually if I don't comment, everything's fine. Okay. I only put comments if something's wrong or if you say something cute makes me smile. So, good? Make yeah. sense? Yeah. So, some of you guys, this is what I'm going to talk about next. Here's what happened on your exam. Now, there's a bunch of statistics up here, some of which I want to get into starting today, some of which we won't talk about for a while, but we'll talk, start about. This, these are what I call the summary statistics of your guys' exams. Okay? We've got what's called an average. Now, we know what an average is. Do you remember what an average is from last week? We started talking about this last week, and I, I made you understand what an average was because I asked the question what is an average and you guys told me how to calculate it which was great but then I asked you what does it mean and nobody could explain what it meant which doesn't surprise me at all because we're Americans and they don't, they don't explain what things mean in school sometimes they just tell you what it is so what is an average again do you remember it was like all the information put together and then um, separated like equally boom Desiree. Desiree thank you Desiree's got it nailed perfectly if I were to take, now I, I gotta look at this again, hang on one second, five, six, seven, 13, 19. There are about 40 of you took this exam. Roughly 40 of you took this exam. If I took 40 of you times 80, that's what, 3,200 points. 3,200 total points were scored on this exam. If I gave everybody in the room an 80, we'd still have 3,200 points. You'd all have the exact same grade. Now that didn't happen. That did not happen on the exam. We had a bunch of zeros for whatever reason. We had plenty of hundreds. We had lots of 90s. Lots of, I was stoked with the exam turnouts. But the average was 80. That means if we took that total number of points you guys earned and spread it equal, you all would have had an 80. Should I do that as an instructor? Exactly, that doesn't make any sense from an educational standpoint. Averages are good sometimes. And sometimes they're not good. And that's why I don't like looking exclusively at an average because it gives me, uh, it misleads me sometimes. Especially when it's paired with this guy, which I don't want to get into too much in this class. Who's taking 243 again? Oh, hell, oh good. That's, that number of hands is going up since being the term. Yay, happy, happy. This is a huge idea in 243. You've talked about it a little bit. When we talked about the margin of error, we, we mentioned that. I had you guys, some of you guys did a quiz on it a couple weeks ago. A margin of error is a measure of uncertainty or a measure of plus or minus around an average. You guys plus or minus 33 points around an average of 80. That is a huge plus or minus. I'm used to that being around 10, 15 points. 33 is huge. So then I say to myself, what the hell? How could I have had a, a sigma, a plus or minus 33 points? So I kept reading. 
The median, I'll come back to this in a second. The median was 94. Now, I haven't talked about the median much in this class. Remember what the median is? It's okay if you don't. Some of you may have learned it at some point in your lives. Middle. Define middle for me, Jory. So if you look at the, the smallest and the largest, and you look in the middle. If you put them in order, smallest to largest, and I count up, it's the one that's in the middle. So we already figured out we had about 40 people in the class. So if I go down around 20 people, I'm going to hit the median. I'm going to hit the median. Now it turns out that median, I think, lands in the highest score in this group right here, which ends up being that 94. So you think, if the average is an 80, how can the median be a 94? How could the average be so much lower than the median? How could that possibly have happened? Zeros? Because of the zeros that happened. The zeros, these things are statistics called outliers. Things that are random events that are kind of weird. Outliers pull averages in the direction of the outliers. They, they pull them down. Give, give you a perfect example of this. Years ago in the 70s, uh, Oklahoma State? Oklahoma? No, Indiana State University. Indiana State University. Business Department, Indiana State University released a pamphlet. They said, a graduate with a bachelor's degree in business from Indiana State University will, on average, make $10,000 more in their first year of work than a bachelor's degree handy, uh, holding candidate in any, from any other school in the country. $10,000 more. This is 1970s, too, so that's a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal now. It's an even bigger deal then. Were they lying? No. <laughs> Good. No. No, actually, they were not. Were they being misleading? Yes. Because who graduated from Indiana State University in the 70s with a bachelor's degree in business and went on to play professional basketball for the Boston Celtics for a long time, if I remember correctly? Larry Bird. Oh. They put his NBA salary in the calculation of the other <laughs> business students. Were they lying? No. 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 Because they, all they said was a bachelor's degree holding candidate will make on average. Now, it wasn't lying, completely misleading. Completely misleading. And the problem is Larry Bird is what's called an outlier. He's extreme compared to the other data. Just like these zeros are extreme compared. Look at the gap between the chunk of the grades up here and those down there. Now those happen for all kinds of reasons. There's some of that stuff I have to deal with. It wasn't Blackboard didn't load right. People misread instructions. There's all kinds of reasons why that happened. Okay, and this is probably going to change as I get in there and actually fix all these things. But right now, this is why I didn't see an average of 80 and go, oh crap, I've already taken 10 points. No, that's a knee-jerk reaction. I want to look at the rest of it. Look at the mode. Most of you got 100. The mode is the most frequently occurring score. The mode was 100. Most of you got, half of you got 100s. 20 out of 40. Well, actually, I shouldn't say 100. It's got between a 95 and 100, I should say. Half of you got between a 95 and 100. The plot down here is called a box plot. This shows you the distribution of grades by what are called quartiles. The highest quartile you can't even see because the highest quartile was all hundreds. The top 25% of the students in the class got hundreds. The next 25% down got between a 95 and 100. So right now, half of the class got between a 95 and 100, which you can tell by up here as well. The next 25% down averaged from an 80 to a 95. So now we're talking about 75% of the class going from an 80 up to 100. You feeling pretty good about this? You should be. Where does the weirdness happen? In the bottom quartile, from 80 down to the zero. All kinds of weird spread happened down there for all numbers of reasons. Whether it was blackboard issues, whether it was people didn't read correctly. There's all kinds of reasons why it didn't happen. And we're gonna fix those, we're gonna fix those. But that's why I don't just look at an average and go, <clears throat> I don't just freak out. I look at the average and I go, okay, what the hell's going on? Oh, look, the median's a 94, the mode's a 100. Okay, I got some weirdness going on. So, cool? That's your first statistical analysis. Yay. 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 Exactly. That's kind of what 243 is quite a bit, honestly. We'll do more of that. Oh, it's great. It's very, very good. If you're like looking at the data and pulling something from it. So I look at that and I feel <clears throat> stoked. I'm about to get stoked here, and here's why. So some of you guys have noticed there's a rainy day coupon. Let me actually crack that open here. I haven't talked about it much. I talked about the project coupon once because the project coupon was actually applicable and it is applicable. Let's go back to it here. Make sure you guys can see all this. All right. 
So the rainy day coupons at the top here, there, there is a project one. Some of you have used it. Most of you won't use it if statistics are any indication. So all that means is if you forget a project is due, when's your next project due? Wednesday. Wednesday. Suppose you walk in here Wednesday and go, God, shoot, it's gone. I didn't do it. What does this do? It buys you 24 hours to print it out, do it manually, and hand it in at my office. You have to follow all the checks. You have to print the coupon. None of that being color. Print the coupon, staple it to the project, bring it by the office before 24 hours have elapsed. There's a bunch of hoops you got to jump through. But it saves you from getting a zero on the project, which is a good thing. If you don't use that, it's worth five points in the term. Most of you will get those five points and keep them. That's just if, if statistics is any, or if history is any guide. But I want to talk about the ready day exam coupon. And the quiz coupon, I want to mention that one too, but let's get to the exam coupon first. This allows you to go back into your exam and make up five points on the exam. Okay, so if you lost, if you lost some points, you can make up back to five of them back by doing what's on this coupon. You again have to print stuff, <laughs> including the coupon. And you just have to submit it. You can give this, there's no time on this one. I didn't put, I put a due date as the end of the last week of the term. So you got five weeks to get this done and turn it in. I think it's better to do it earlier than later while it's fresh in your mind, personally speaking. I mean, you don't have to, but it's my personal opinion. Um, but just take a look at the you must, you must. It's kind of like a Ten Commandments, thou shalt, thou shalt not. The one thing I have to put on here, the corrections must be correct. I had to add that because the first year, I've been doing this for about eh, six or seven years now. The first year I did, I didn't have that on there. People were turning in whatever. I was like, this isn't right. They're like, it never said you had to be right. I'm like, wow, okay, litigious society. Now it has to be right when you turn it in. <laughs> so anyway, make sure you do check, 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 check. And then hand it in. You can bring it to class, it's totally fine. There's no 24 hour time limit on this one. This is, I want you to go back and look. Why do I do this? Two reasons, give me two. Number one, awesome. Ash. We learned and we can get our points back. That's actually both of them right there. That was both of the reasons. I, I'm gonna get you guys too. Number one, you go back and look at it again, which means the exam is in a dead assessment. Go back and look at it again. See if you missed. You might not have missed anything. Maybe you were one of the half the class that got 100. Good for you. I apologize. That coupon isn't worth anything, isn't worth anything for you. My apologies. But if you lost five points, which also a quarter of you did, go back and fix those five. Get the five back. Because I want you to learn again. But I know you won't go back and look at it unless I give you a carrot and a points. <clears throat> so therefore, I help your grade too. Amy, what were you going to say? I was going to say... Sometimes you learn more from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. Oh, because hell yeah! They, oh, they God. stick in your mind. Dude, yeah. this guy right here. Yes, yes. I can recall the first million, and I'll forget this one too over time. One of my favorite lyrics from my favorite bands of all time. Yes, it's called First Failure. And it's, yes, there's, not, there's so much truth in that statement. Brittany, please. I was just going to say because you understand life happens. Oh, God, yes. Oh, oh, yes, of course, absolutely. And that's why I like having these. I'm going to have one more starting next term, now that I know Blackboard more. A Blackboard one time and one time only, it's okay to not use Blackboard. You can hand it to me in person. Coupon. i got to figure out how to weight it with point-wise, because Blackboard apparently has little red. I like Blackboard a lot more now. I do. I do. I, do. I like it a lot more. You know why I like it? Did I, I, I tell you my epiphany? No. You learned more days. about it. Within five days. You, you hated it. I did. I hated it Wednesday, but I, I, I realized. The problem isn't Blackboard. The problem is you guys aren't trained to use Blackboard. And a very small percentage of you are having a hell of a time for lots of reasons, whether it's interfaces, whether it's Macs, whether it's whatever, of getting stuff turned into a format that I can see. Now, the thing is, that very small percentage of you, and I, I don't mean you, I mean all my students, I hear from them all the time. So I was getting this biased view of Blackboard that all my students were having a hell of a time. And when I actually went and spent 20, 30 hours over the past week in there looking at it, I'm like, people are having a fine time in Blackboard. It was just a very small percentage that were. So I decided all I got to do is have a little, a little learning session on the first week of class every term for those who, aren't, who can't get Blackboard. I already have the first thing. I'm going to make a new quiz, a new series of quizzes up. Take these three PDF pages, merge them into one. There's one quiz, or one part of the quiz. Go to this website, take a screenshot of this picture, paste it into a Word document, and submit it to Blackboard. There's a part of the quiz. I'm going to make a quiz that's just submitting stuff, random stuff, not math stuff. And I'm going to tell people, if you can't get a 10 on this quiz, then you've got to be here on Friday at 8 o'clock in the morning in this computer lab, and we'll learn how to do this stuff together. That's what I figured out. Blackboard's working great for like 98% of people. It's pissing 2% of people off an awful lot. It was pissing me off 110%, but now I realize everything's fine except for those 2%, and I don't want to lose those 2%. So yeah, I'm good now. Epiphany. Don't be a hater. You gotta learn how to play the game. That's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Actually, that's what you said. But the, 
The point is, I thought it was a more, I thought it was a more systemic problem of all my students. That's why it, I hated it so much. It was, it was keeping my students, I thought, from showing me what they knew. Now I know I just got to fix two percent. Have little meetings, a little little seance, a little, little pizza party with uh, with Blackboard. Cool. Good. And there's a, there's also one for the quizzes. Um, there's a rainy day quiz coupon. I, a few of you asked me about this. Some of you tanked a quiz here and there. You got like a two on a quiz, which is totally fine. Um, you, you know it hurts your grade though. Not as much anymore, because now you've got this huge chunk of exam points in, which is going to pretty much negate those. But you can make one quiz up to get the full 10 points back on it. The way you correct it is the same as you correct for the exam. So just make it, that's why it's such a short little piece of, piece of writing. It's just basically, it says look up here and do the same thing up here. Yeah? So but if we do more than 10 quizzes, you choose the best scores. No, I, I use every quiz you give me. Okay. That's as soon as you submit a quiz, that's you admitting, yes, I want you to use this. Does that make sense? And historically, as you saw from the, well, you don't remember this anymore because it was six weeks ago. Historically, the more quizzes students do, on average, the better their average gets. That's, it, that's an average, right? Yeah. That's Because as Desiree told me, that, that's, that's more like a socialistic kind of thing. But that's all I can look at. I can't look at individual people. I can't look at an outlier and say, this person did 20 quizzes and failed my course. That's an outlier, right? On average, grades go up as more quizzes are done. F fair? So yes, when you submit a quiz, it's your, you're admitting to me you want me to grade it. Good? Any other questions? That was a lot of non-math. Well, some math, I guess. Some math, some stats. But I want to make sure, I want to make sure you guys knew you guys kicked that exam's ass. Well done. I mean, seriously, well done. It was, it was a pleasure to look at, pleasure to look at your work. I loved watching you guys puzzling through the Pilot Butte problem. How do I how to measure this trail? Good, go figure it out. That's why I give you three weeks to figure out how to measure that trail. Think about it in life. How often do you know exactly what you have to do when you have to do it? The funny thing is, I solved that problem literally two minutes before the deadline. Excellent! You didn't start it two minutes before the deadline, did no, you? No, no, okay. no, I started it three weeks ago and I kept like spacing out. Well, that's okay. Again, God, why I give you three weeks, then, then it I might watched, take you three weeks to find that two minutes. Then I, then I watched the movie, that, movie. One, of, one of the movies that you were that you put on oh, like, video. the videos, and okay. I decided to measure it with a string. Oh, I met the Burma Road. You watched the Burma Road one. Yes, good, 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 good. I forgot I made a video for them. I didn't have string, so I used like the thing from my back. I've made, I've made thousands of videos at this point, and I've lost track of which ones I've made, which ones I haven't. So good. The Burma Road, I forgot the Burma Road video actually. Yeah, that happens all the time if you guys ever use a topo map. And I think, how many, how many of you have, besides on my exam, have used the topo map before? Only a couple of you, only a handful. Right, if you guys climb mountains, like you ever climb Mount Jefferson or Mount, maybe not Mount Hood, but maybe like Mount Jefferson or a remote peak, you probably want to use a topo map to figure out where you are. It gives you good indicators of where things are. Like, you're looking at a mountain, and you're like, okay, I want to go up there. Well, you might want to look at the topo map and make sure there doesn't have like a 100 foot cliff that you have to negotiate on it. And the topo map will show you that. That's why I like sneaking those in uh, here and there. You can, of course, to choose your own adventure, you can choose not to do that one. How many of you guys did the Burma Road quiz? Yeah, only a couple of you. That was, what, that was I, I love that one because it was a student. It was a student idea, which it's funny. I just saw her. I saw the student that uh, asked me that question a couple of days ago, and she's like, oh, "It's not any easier to walk up the damn thing." I'm like, "Well, take smaller steps." She's like, "It's gonna take you forever to get there." I'm like, "Try it, see." And this works. This works for anybody climbing up a very large, like, like Burma Road or like a mountain. Take smaller steps, and if you get tired, turn around, take some backwards. She's like, I can now beat my husband up the hill because you're going more efficiently by taking smaller steps. It's kind of like when you're riding a bike up a hill, downshift. Downshift one or two gears down, you'll be more efficient. Your heart won't have to work as hard. Your muscles won't have to work. You won't go hypoxic so quickly. Is that what you're going to say, Amy? That's what I was going to say. You won't be burning so much oxygen. You're spreading it out. Good, good. There's a physiological thing. Lance Armstrong taught me that before he was busted for doping, but he taught me how to be efficient in the mountains. And I've always respected him for that because like, he figured out that if I down, he's always in one or two, he was, always in one or two gears down from his competition. Have you ever seen him in the mountains? Not Brandon, he was doped to the gills, but still, he was still a physiological freak before he was doping. And it's incredible how much energy you can save. So I just love learning from you guys and then giving something back to you at that race. There was another hand somewhere, I thought, Please, Josh, yes. When you were talking about walking up a mountain efficiently, yeah. the most efficient way, my, well, what I learned is to lock your knees on each step up. Really? Like, yeah, it causes you to put weight on the bone instead of, like, as you're walking. Oh, like when you extend your knee all the way out, you lock. 
skeleton. Resting on your skeleton. That, you got to be careful about the hyperextend, I think, is, Mary, is what we're going to be worried about there. Yes, as a climber, I know resting on your skeleton is better. Have you ever seen climbers climbing with just their upper body? That's how they climbed <sighs> Ah, you, you're going to blow yourself out. You want to be able to hang back like this and let your skeleton take... That's how they climbed what? That's how they climbed Everest. They developed the technique to climb Everest. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. I did not know that. Huh. I mean, if people with hyperextensive knees can't climb Everest. I mean, I, I, it's not can't. It's that we can't use this strategy. I don't do that myself. Because, I, yeah, I don't do this... My knees look like... Horse knees. Ah, they bend backwards. I got you. I got you. Yeah, Anya, I'm with you. I don't know if I could do that just because I know my knees pretty well, but I've also built up the muscles around my knees to kind of take the weight from that. There's all kinds of tricks. It's all physics and it's all physi physiology and it's all cardiovascular, but I love the fact that we can leak you into this class and wait here and there, which is yay. It makes me happy. So, cool. I'll get your next exam.